Hi, and welcome to the third episode of Surfing the Portal. This is incredible information we're hatching here. Uh, this is the most, probably the most dangerous program on the internet. If you're receiving this, uh, or you see this on YouTube, you probably should download it. Because of something that was said on this program last week, um, I got uh, restricted from Pinecone Utopia's Google Hangouts. And that's pretty amazing. Uh, so I don't know what we're saying, but it seems to be uh, resonating with somebody uh, in not in a good way for them. Anyway, my name's Paul Marco, and the purpose of this program is to give uh, people a chance to uh, talk to us through the chat room, which I haven't really uh, got in touch with yet, but I'll try to in a minute. Uh, get in touch with questions about things that might have been put on the Pinecone Utopia portal. Now, if you remember from weeks past, the reason that we do the Pinecone Utopia portal is to uh, one, number one, do some research. What kind of consciousness raising, mindfulness, prayer, uh, those type of techniques have you used if you're selected or targeted individual that has helped you relieve some of your suffering? And we're collecting them so that we can, and it's an open source so anybody can see this. We're collecting them so that it can be shared amongst the whole community and we can get more feedback on how this is working. Uh, then eventually, I think what will happen with the research is that we'll uh, be able to find patterns uh, to, uh, you know, this type of technique seems to raise vibration and is especially effective against this type of thing. I don't know what we're going to find, but if we can do, a, if we can find a hypothesis, then we can do some tests. We can find out maybe how to break the code. I don't know. Also on that website are techniques that uh, I know about and other people know about it, that we've collected and put on there for you to try. If you're a TI or a special individual, and you don't even have to be selected. You can just do this as a way of protecting yourself against future encroachments. These are good techniques to learn how to control yourself, control your vibration, and control what I think is your connection to the universe. Anyway, so this is going to be a, somewhat of a very special show because we have guests. We have at least one guest, maybe another one. Uh, both have uh, written things either to put on the Pinecone Utopia portal or soon to be put on, as soon as my uh, technical help comes back. Uh, she'll be able to uh, put the new things that have been. We've been reading them. I just haven't put them on the uh, the portal yet. So they'll, they'll come up. Today, we're going to talk uh, to uh, Romola D. And most of you know who Romola D is. She's the uh, most dangerous journalist and art teacher in the United States. <laughs> <laughs> closely surveilled and, and monitored. Uh, and probably one of the most lovely people I've ever encountered. She's going to talk with us about a technique that she employs that seems to help her. And when actually when she first told me about this technique and about the uh, results she was getting, uh, it really just blew me away because it was affecting uh, the behavior of many, many people, just her internal process. So uh, why don't we start off by talking a little bit uh, to Ramola about uh, being on the program and uh, uh, working with us to find these techniques. Hi, Ramola. Hi, Paul. Thanks for having me. And thanks for that um, stunning intro. <laughs> <laughs> Dangerous. Uh, yeah, it's too funny. I mean, it's absurd. All of us who are being surveilled and monitored in this way, we're the last thing from being dangerous, and yet we're being projected and portrayed as such. It's an absolute joke. Yeah. Just the most healthy, uh, growing, vibrating, intelligent human beings. Wow. That's, that's, a, that's a real threat to the high point. It really is. Mm -hmm. Apparently. 
apparently so anybody who can think on their own two feet and you know speak up for themselves is um, considered dangerous today <laughs> yeah well so uh it was interesting after we after we decided to gather these type of techniques because before this we were mostly mm -hmm. looking at gathering evidence to present authorities right but right. uh we decided on, on one or two of the podcasts to also incorporate this direction which uh helps you not so much fight back but to climb out of the uh Climb out of the maze, climb out of the box, climb out of the matrix. Something yes, like and I love that idea because in a sense it's kind of, you know, tunneling through because um, the matrix in which we're all being bound and this uh, horrific surveillance state that we're all being surrounded by uh, seeks to kind of box us in in very concrete ways, you know. But um, what you are talking about and the kind of methodologies that, you know, some of us have started to explore already um, a means to kind of tunnel through or break out, as you say, climb out of the maze, even as uh, it seeks to box us in. So we kind of escape from it anyway. So it's a kind of a powerful concept, I think, to uh, to understand that that we 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 do have, you know, it's um you know the the Buddhist monk, Buddhist the Tibetan monk, Tathan. Yeah, Tathan. That's the. Yeah. If Naomi comes on, she's going to talk about him. Oh, great, great. I'm just remembering a book that he's written called Be Free Where You Are. And it's the text of a talk that he gave at a correctional institution at a prison in the U.S., and I forget where exactly. But he walked in and he actually, um, you know, gave this long talk to, them, to those uh, people who were incarcerated. And he talked to them about conquering anger. And uh, he talked to them about his own anger, um, about uh, that, you know, he had experienced seeing whole villages raised during the Vietnam War and uh, how he conquered that anger and how and the ways in which he recommended that people begin to use to you know, stabilize their breathing, to calm down, to bring their entire emotional energy from sort of way up right down to their solar plexus and their navel, you know, lie down, possibly bring everything down to the thumbs and gravity of the navel, breathe deeply and let, let the go. Um, and so yeah. No, that's that's really that's really great. I think it's interesting that Taknat Han got his inspiration by trying to overcome the situation he was facing in Vietnam, isn't mm -hmm. it funny that the Phoenix program was driving these people? In other words, the same Phoenix program that they're applying to us today was the one that got Taknat Han started. You know that's what I mean? true. That's true. Exactly. How extraordinary, isn't it? So it's sort of coming full circle now because the Phoenix program has come home to roost in the USA today. Absolutely. And we need all the help we can get to deal with this madness. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, the thing that uh, really struck me about that little book, and I actually, it's a very small book, and I uh, sent it around as a Christmas present or as a, you know, going away parting teacher's present as well. I hand it around to people because it's the kind of thing you can carry in your purse. You can read it at stoplights. It's very inspiring. And, and one of the things that it basically says, the basic message of the book, is that despite whatever ghastly circumstance you find yourself in, such as being in prison, you know, um, where you literally have no control over some of your external physical circumstances, you can still be free where you are. And the way you do that is by going <laughs> You know, you, you do your, your meditation and your breathing and you go inward and you, um, and you become free. You, you enter a space of peacefulness and serenity. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting. You always think of accessing the, the universe going externally. Correct, when yes. The depth of the universe is internally. It's a much deeper feeling when you go in that way and you're away from the external matrix. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And this is what the, the great yogis have all said. And, you know, this is what Buddhist mm -hmm. 
teaches and um, I guess various religions. I mean, even the Gnostic Gospels, right, talk about this going inward. Yeah, well, I think uh, when I was learning about the Enneagram initially, uh, one of the examples that they give about uh, the Enneagram in use, Enneagram is a personality typing. Uh, it's, it's very ancient, very ancient. Yes. It can track back 3,000, 4,000 years. And, it's uh, value, but I'd love to hear more about it. Yeah, it, it was kept alive by the Sufis and ah. then brought to the West, um, actually, uh, by. Uh, was it Essilor Institute, which I know is a part of Tavistock, but anyway. Oh, right. Have, oh, right. It, came, it, come, it came through that lineage, and uh, I cannot remember all of the, uh, the teachers. My teacher for that would be Helen Palmer. But anyway, it's, it's a typing. I think it's pretty accurate. I used it in executive coaching for 10 years. I mean, it's a, it's a fine, very interesting program. But anyway. They would talk about how the Franciscans, which is a sect of Christianity, I'm not sure whether it's Catholic. I think it is Catholic. Mm -hmm. uh, they would visit the different monks who were meditating in the caves. And the problem, the thing that separated the monk from uh, going internally enough to reach, uh, to reach connection with their God was their Enneagram type. Oh, in other wow. words, the type three is a performer, and they want to be really good at everything. Huh. And the type three would uh, always go in, and he would beat himself on, you know, not being able to do it right, or you know, mm -hmm. or there's the, the the number one type who's the perfectionist, and the, mm -hmm. her her or his perfectionist would separate him from the ability to reach oneness. So. That's how the Franciscans use it with their meditating monks. So I would assume from that story, if the story is correct, that Christianity has at least some connection with that particular, uh, what they, I think that would consider an Eastern art, although mm -hmm. boy, uh, meditation is. Right, right. And, and I guess in the Christian tradition also, um, there's different forms of meditation. Yeah, there's guided meditation, mm -hmm. um, and then there's, of course, the Vipassana, which is the one I know about, um, mm -hmm. okay, other types of meditation. Yeah, uh, so you can so focus, you can focus, you can not focus. Go ahead, Ramol, I'm sorry. I was going to say, you know, actually, if you look at the different Eastern traditions, there are many, many ways in which, you know, one can meditate. There are many, many uh, forms of instruction. Mm -hmm. Ways of getting to get ways of absolute stillness, I think. Um, I mean, I'm familiar with a few of them. Uh, you know, I've uh, learned a little bit of meditation both from the yogi tradition, that's from Paramhamsa Yogananda, and, uh -huh. and also from the Buddhist tradition. Actually, the because there is a Buddhist and I have been to it and been introduced to the Dhammakaya method of meditation. Oh. So, yeah, so there's slightly different methodologies. I mean, I can talk about a couple of them if you want. Yeah, it might be interesting. That might be interesting. Go okay. ahead, Brian, tell us. Okay, so one of the things actually connected to that whole conversation Oh, by the way, oh, I'm hearing yeah. a lot of uh, there's a lot of echo. Are you okay, what I'm going to do is I'll plug in headsets. That might help. I guess. Might help. That's the only thing I know to do. Okay. I'm using headsets, and it usually seems to help. Does that help? Great. Oh, yes. It's fabulous. Yes. Yeah, you've cut out some of that ambient sound or whatever it was. Um, so, okay, so I was going to talk about conscious breathing, right, which is the technique that I was um, talking about on forum the other day um, as a means of um, breaking out of the matrix and breaking that lock on or that tracking hold that these guys are able to engage in with their remote radiation weaponry. 
Um, so conscious breathing is nothing but actually being very uh, uh, materially conscious of your in-breath and your out-breath which is not something that one does on a regular basis, right? I mean, we kind of breathe in an involuntary kind of way. Um, it's not something we think about. We just sort of, you know, scoop in the air and we, and we exhale it constantly. But if you, con if you consciously breathe, what, is, what it actually does is it kind of slows down your entire system because you end up doing a bit of deep breathing and you're kind of doing a, a conscious inhale and a conscious exhale. And, um, you know, if you look at the yogi tradition, there are several ways in which you can use breath to uh, connect with sound, to connect with, um, you know, repetition and mantra and all of the benefits of that, because what it does is it kind of stills the mind, or at least I think that's the idea, to still the mind. All right, does this sound familiar, Paul? Yeah, it's, it's really interesting. And I was just looking at it from the perp standpoint how uh -huh. uh, frustrating it must be for them to be yeah. sitting there. And they're, they're supposed to be predicting your, de your behavior at this point. And now <laughs> they, can't even, they can't even chart it because you're, you're just climbing out of the box. Yes, I think that's exactly right. Because I think what happens when you still the mind, even if it's for just a few minutes or even a few seconds within a minute, you're kind of breaking out of that bind of being trackable or mappable, right? Because they're engaging in neural network mapping and you're kind of escaping that. Um, so in, I think, the yogi tradition that I know, there are two famous kinds of, uh, you know, there are two mantras. One is so hum and the other is hong sa. It's just the reverse of the, uh, the sound. It's actually um, so hung or hung sa is just like, you know, uh, it, it's kind of saying not my will but thine kind of it's like self versus source or self versus God so you just take in a breath and you go so and you go um, and you, you exhale you go hum and you do that on and on and on and on and you do not actually you stop thinking in a sense you're just doing you're focusing on the repetition of the mantra and the breath you're really coordinating your breath with the, the saying the silent saying of the mantra in your head and that kind of you know puts you in that space where you start to move away from i guess the sort of dimensional plane that we're in and you kind of enter an inner plane of um tranquility and you're you you are good you're probably going to experience physiologically a sense of calming down and slowing down as um, you proceed because basically all you're doing is you're focusing on your breath you're focusing on that inhale and exhale now i've also found that you can do that without using sort of these ancient sanskrit mantra sounds you can do it simply saying you know i breathe in light i breathe out light something like that or if you i was in the garden this morning and i can tell you Usually, when I go outside, you know, just because uh, being dangerous and everything, they put, they get the planes out, they get the helicopters out, they get the neighbors with the power saws out. Um, I don't know what they're trying to accomplish, but basically, it sounds like they're making one heck of a racket and sort of disturbing the, you know, the sense of tranquility in the atmosphere. You know, because uh, imagine Sunday morning, mid morning, birds are singing, sun is out, lovely day. And uh, here you have these lunatic neighbors sort of amping it up, ramping it up, and sending the kids out to play. And by the way, not just play at any kind of normal decibel volume, but screaming their heads off as they're playing. This is going on, and it seemed to me this morning that it was so negative. So I determined to, I was watering the plants in my garden, and I determined I wasn't going to put, put everything down and run away inside. I was going to continue watering the plants, and I decided to do the conscious breathing and I just sort of looked at whatever I was watering and I went, you know, I breathe in Rose of Sharon, I breathe out hydrangeas, I breathe in bear, I breathe it's out grass. Because, <laughs> you know, that's what I was doing. It was because I love, I love what I'm surrounded by in the garden. The garden's beautiful. And um, how could you not connect with nature, you know? So I just did that. And they did not stop. They, they amped it up. It's like they got two or three more people from around the block to pull out their power saws and go you know at high volume ignore them <laughs> and i kept doing this and you see i've noticed another thing in my case because i'm targeted and tracked non-stop on a continuous basis it's mostly when they can't quite lock on to me or track me that's when they uh pull out the noise harassment 
So it seemed to me it was working actually. <laughs> You know, so they were going on with their little agenda of noise harassment, and I was enjoying the birds and the bees and the butterflies and the sunshine and the wild grasses and all the late blooming flowers in my garden. So, well, you know, at the same time, frustrating, but well, at the same time, frustrating your, uh, your perps to death over there. <laughs> probably, probably. So, but you know, I determined I don't care what they're doing. I'm gonna. I'm standing out here. I'm breathing in the wonderful air. I'm connected to nature, and I'm gonna keep going. So, <laughs> so that yeah. was great. You know, so that was great. Um, I remember the let last. Me, time let me let me interject something here, Ramal. Okay, okay, sure. Yeah. Just from a scientific stand, a more scientific standpoint, if I can explain this, mm -hmm. uh, your your breath. The reason that so much Eastern. Here comes yourself. I can see you. You clicked yourself back on the screen there. Oh, actually, my, my whole computer went off and I turned the slide bar on. There we oh. go. Didn't mean to do that. <laughs> no, it's okay. Uh, well, anyway, your, uh, your, your uh, breath is part of your sympathetic nervous system and also your asympathetic nervous system. Hmm. Now, I get these mixed up. One is automatic. You know, it's like your digestive system. It's just, right. I think they call it sympath sympathetic. Okay. But asympathetic means you can control it. So your breath uh. works automatically, but you can control it. So when you focus on your breath, there's a connection between your mind and your breath. When you're breathing deeply and slowly, your mind mm -hmm. relaxes. When your mind is excited, it stimulates the sympathetic part of your respiratory system, and you start breathing in your upper chest rapidly. So when you focus on your breath and take it over, and you make mm -hmm. it slow and carefully and breathing in the beautiful air and breathing out. What you're doing is you're changing your brain. Your brain is responding to your breath and relaxing it. So you can control your brain by controlling your breath. It's not mm -hmm. easy. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's kind of scientifically how that works. Mm-hmm. I believe it, yes, because you definitely have a different feeling. A, a few minutes, a few, well, I don't even know if it's minutes, it might be, you know, seconds, a few seconds of conscious, mindful breathing really calms your entire body down. And, you know, that must happen also from the level of the brain, right? Right. I think, and I think that the, the uh, idea that uh, it has to take a long time or you have to meditate for hours. Uh, mm -hmm. No, you no, don't I think really. It's, yeah, I don't think you do. I think uh, it's more quality than than quantity. Mm -hmm. Yes, and in fact, I th that's a good point that you raise actually, because I think a lot of people are put off by the idea of meditation because they think they have to sit and sit and sit, and you know, try to get into the state of mind or whatever. But actually, um, the greatest benefits can accrue in these little spurts. Even if uh, you take a couple minutes out of the out of your morning and just um, devote to mindful, conscious breathing and being in a quiet place, you can enter that space of absolute serenity. And you know you can feel that. Uh, and I think everybody who meditates has that experience of feeling as if they're breathing in very cool water, right? Like sort of you're you're in a very cool space. Your entire body cools down. And your, even the air that you breathe in suddenly seems to be very cool as it enters your body. Um, and, and that seems to be the space in which you're entering that realm of, um, you know, almost other dimensional tranquility or serenity. Exactly. Now, when you're doing this, uh, there's going to be a struggle because your mind wants to chatter away. It wants to talk about this. It wants to talk about how more comfortable you would be on this couch if there was one more pillow on my back. <laughs> yeah. it wants to, and in my, my mind, I don't know whether everybody else's mind, but I get musical headrunners. 
there's music there's music playing in the background and it's usually um, not one of my favorite pieces of music just kind of an annoying little huh. music going in the background but I've noticed that I've in order for me to to really move into that state I've got to consciously stop thinking stop the chatter mm -hmm. and turn off the radio in there my radio ah. so 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 you're going to be concentrating on the breathing and yeah. then when your thoughts come in you're just going to kind of push them aside right yeah so. right exactly and the other thing to remember is um that's a, what you what you're pointing to exactly is that does indeed happen once thoughts do keep rising up but um i think it's it's much easier if we don't take a perfectionistic sort of attitude toward it but kind of let it be you know so what if you know you've had a few thoughts interrupting your flow interrupting your meditation interrupting your mindful breathing you can slip right back into it you know there's no there are no rules obviously you can slip right back into it that's a good point i think you're right i always do i always fight it i always try to get the little guy to stop talking about paul marco's problems mm -hmm. and, yeah uh, I, right right like, but uh, I, yeah yeah but i think if it happens or not if you're able to achieve that you know i understand one fights with one's mind and one's thoughts yeah. uh, to, to, to try to stop it but but whether you achieve that stopping or not it's i think it's okay to to let that moment be and for in the next moment you come back and you keep trying again with the breath you know you oh, hold yeah. on so, yeah that's great so that helps a lot um you know, the last time that I was talking, I think, with Mindy and uh, and you about this conscious breathing, there was something else that I was doing that I thought was kind of cool. Now, I, I would like to read more about it because I know other people are kind of researching in this field, right, about um, Lynn Taggart, for instance. Oh, sorry, her name is Lynn McTaggart. Yeah. She's a science journalist. She's written a couple books, The Field which is, um, I have it right in front of me, The Quest for the Secret Force of the Universe, where she interviewed a whole bunch of different scientists from different fields who were making incredibly um, interesting discoveries, uh, new discoveries, um, you know, in, in their fields, in their various fields. Um, discoveries that had to do with intention affecting reality, uh, discoveries to do with, you know, seeds giving out light, things like that. Um, and things like um, how our thoughts can affect the space in which we live. So there is a field so that connecting all of us and our thoughts can affect that field. You know, her other book is called The Intention Experiment, which is about how when you hold intention, uh, you can ripple that intention out into the world if you are rippling outward from a coherent space. And that coherent space has to do with, um, you know, the same kind of space that one enters in meditation, where you're very calm, very tranquil, um, and you're not in any state of negative emotionality. You know, you're kind of in a very level, serene space. So I think some people call that coherence. And uh, from that space, you, if you put your intention out into the world, um, you will be much more powerful in terms of accomplishing that intention or uh, making an effect in the world around you if it's coming from that serene space as opposed to you know coming from a space of intensity or anger or whatever it's, it's, wow, are, yeah you must have heard of that too right well i, I have i have a degree in consciousness studies and oh. people don't even, people don't even know that that's a field that there's actual scientific research being done that it's actually, that people know a lot about it from all a lot of different right. teachings down through the years yeah mm -hmm. so paul i should be interviewing you actually you should be telling us more if you have a degree in consciousness studies because <laughs> that's exactly my point that there are people doing research in this in these fields which is fabulous and i think perhaps what we need to do is get more you know, attuned to kind of the, the kind of discoveries that they're making, because that information, you know, it's not talked about. It's not um, in our school textbooks. It's not in our college textbooks. It's not something we learn unless, you know, like you, if we go off and get a sort of a specific degree. So I think the, 
the information that you have might be vastly interesting and very useful to everybody. Well, I, myself and two colleagues wrote a book that's, well, it's kind of a landmark book. Uh, there's a book that focuses on uh, research done in the consciousness studies, actually devoted to or mostly focused on a way of measuring consciousness expansion called Lovinger's model. And huh. we wrote a book called Post-Conventional Personality. It's, uh, it's published through uh, University of New York Publishers. And it has, it's, it's expensive even in the paperback. Uh, I think it's still in print. We published it in 2011. Mm -hmm. uh, but it, it, it surveys uh, the work that was being done in consciousness studies up into that period. So you can see that, you know, there are ways to look at, at, at uh, consciousness and mm -hmm. there are ways to measure the expansion of consciousness. Uh, well, that's there are people, yeah, it's, it's pretty interesting work. Uh, I thought it was fascinating. It was yes, I'll have to get a copy of this book and look at it. And Paul, just listening to you, it sounds like I should have you on a podcast soon and just, um, you know, have a little chat on the subject. <laughs> yeah, you know, I wanted to talk to you about uh, myself and actually one of my closest friends mm -hmm. have been going around and we've been uh, talking about ways to climb out of the matrix. Okay. And uh, uh, and one of the ways, of course, is consciousness breathing. And by the way, consciousness breathing is just kind of like a uh, a gateway. Mm -hmm. Because I think there's so many things you can build on to that consciousness, consciousness and consciousness. There's so much benefit you can get out of it. And as yeah. you benefit, there are more things you can do with it. It's, it's an amazing thing, and it's easy, and it's really cheap. It doesn't mm -hmm. cost anything. Not at all. When, yeah. No. So we we were talking about uh, intention, and mm -hmm. how intention can actually change the outcomes. Mm -hmm. And and he's he's a firm believer in just what you said that uh, if you certainly getting to that space, getting to the relaxed space is. Mm -hmm. Almost an end goal in itself because it's. I uh, read a. Uh, I was in a yoga meditation center. Oh, well, near you. It was the one. God, it was a. It was a Franciscan monastery changed into, into the Ber in the Berkshires. You, oh, you've I probably see. heard of it. Oh, Kripalu. Uh, Yes, Kripalu. Yeah, that's what it was. Oh, okay. Yes, I have heard of it. And many people go there. And, you know, it's quite famous around here. It's a little bit on the expensive side, though, so I haven't quite gone there. Yeah, it was. <laughs> and in one of the yoga rooms, I saw written on a, uh, uh, a flip chart. Mm -hmm. Nothing's ever accomplished or no, no growth is ever attained unless it's in a state of total relaxation. Oh, that's true. That is very true. That that's absolutely true about meditation. You can't enter those spaces unless you completely let go your body, in terms of relaxing. You know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's best if you leave. I have this concept I call belief wardrobe. You know, like you put it on, and can you change it? Maybe you can, but it's it's a wardrobe you wear. Oh, but you don't true. take that. Yeah, don't take that into your meditation. <laughs> Leave all that stuff outside. Oh, I see. You see it as part of your wardrobe and you leave it at the door. And then as you enter, you enter in a, in a much more vulnerable, open way. Yeah, I was not thinking vulnerable and open. I was thinking of uh, empty. Ah, okay, empty. Yeah. Yes, that's because great. I'm not, yeah. you know, I'm not sure what's left when you take off your wardrobe. Anyway, mm -hmm. so this person and I, we talk about that, and he's, he's a firm believer in the fact that you can, it's like psycho-cybernetics. You know, you can focus and bring things to you. 
Yes, yes. But that's I think that's it's, part of that, you know, the law of attraction and stuff like that, you know. It's the, yeah. Yeah, that kind of thinking. You, but, you, but you know, I yeah, on, on on the one hand, there's a lot of information out there that seems almost new agey. You know, it's like if you do this, this will happen, kind of thing, very formulaic. Yeah. But, but on the other hand, there's a lot to be said for um, the benefits that accrue from meditation and from, um, you know, just being silent and entering your own inner space and so forth. Right. And um, existing also, I think, when you talk about um, things like things like attracting things to you. Um, that goes into sort of the law of abundance. You know, if you if you if you see your life is already being abundant, and if you live in a state of gratefulness or gratitude for what you have, um, you're going to be in a kind of a filled up space mentally, and your uh, the the kind of vibrations you put out are not going to be agitated vibrations or stressed vibrations or negative vibrations. They're probably going to be calmer and more relaxed because you are already in a happy space. You are already grateful for what you have. And that kind of vibration is a more attracting kind of vibration um, from what I've read. So that, that, that idea also comes from, you know, Hinduism as well, from what I can, from yogi signs, from some of what these yogis say. Um, to, to, to say a prayer of gratitude in order to get things, in order, instead of asking for things when you're praying, for instance, you just um, say a prayer of gratitude for what you do have. Well, I have to believe that that works. I mean, if you're, especially if you're in a place of gratitude, you're already thankful for mm -hmm. it. It's just... Yes. Yes, absolutely. And, you know, there's a connection with all of this with, um, with intention, as you were saying, and, you know, that, that coherence space. So, to me, I, I really would like to read more about it. Well, I have, a, I have a theory that goes along with this, but it's a little bit more uh, maybe complicated. Okay. What, about 2009, <clears throat> I was in Jacksonville, Florida, and I was reviewing a, uh, an instrument that was designed for selecting entrepreneurs. At that time, businesses were interested in uh, getting entrepreneurs that they could give seed money, turn them loose, and have them make them a fortune. And so they were looking for these individuals. And uh, I looked at the personality profile of one, and I can tell you that there's no doubt that this person would be successful, but there's no doubt that I wouldn't want this person living in my neighborhood because it, it was a portrait of someone who was pretty obsessive, pretty mm. particular, you know, it was, it, was, mm. uh, it was a border, you know. So anyway, but mm. anyway, the test, I went in and I took a sample of the test. And the way this test works is you answer the first question and then based on your answer, the subsequent questions change. In uh, other words, okay. the branch, at each at each decision, uh -huh. so you can actually get a really refined picture of what this uh, this person is all about from this instrument because it was it was pretty amazing. Yes, that is. So amazing. myself, yeah. So myself being a being a lifetime trainer mm -hmm. and viewing the unfolding of consciousness here on the planet as as possibly being uh, a developmental program, hmm. uh, I, I would think that uh, if I were divine and I were to design this, I would design it like that test, where oh. your free will dealt, your free will deals with your uh, response. In other words, the yes. program gives you a uh -huh. stimulus. And you respond. Well, based on your response, it's going to give the uh, program an inkling of, of, of where you are and where you can go. In other mm -hmm. words, they're not going to give you stupid questions that obviously a person who responded like you did to the first one would, mm -hmm. would not even have to consider. Mm 
So it could get more and more complicated and more and more sophisticated. And give and so the free will is in uh, responding at the highest level you can with the intention. Mm -hmm. And then and then the program writes itself based on your response. It just seems to be that that whole idea fascinates mm -hmm. me. So I, I love to talk to this friend of mine about if there is free will, and I think there certainly is a measure of it, uh, how mm -hmm. does it interplay with the overall design, you know? Mm -hmm. And and many would right. argue that, that that is what is going on actually on planet Earth, that we're sort of in this sort of rehab school where well, our very responses are being tested uh, <laughs> to all of the different stimuli that are thrown at us. And uh, in right. and that we take, as you say, exactly branches off into other paths, all of them determined by our own free will choosing as we make those movements and as we react to things that happen to us. Um, yeah, it sounds like the string theory. The way yeah. I, when I heard you repeat it back, it never occurred to me before, but yeah. That's true. And, and according to, well, I think it's, um, Catherine should be here, but I think according to string theory or some part of quantum mechanics, right, there's this theory that every single choice that you generate uh, actually generates a new you in a different universe. <laughs> so there are these yes. multiple universes occurring with multiple versions of you in each of those universes going off and doing something slightly different in each. <laughs> so. Wow. Well, kind of a wild yeah, idea. it is kind of a wild idea. I actually I heard somebody talking about that. Oh, it might have been about a year ago, a year and a half ago. And they said, well, in that scenario, you'll never die. Because every oh, time, right, it will be infinite. Right. Every time you branch off to death, you branch off to life again. Mm, yeah, very interesting. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I think these are the kind of things you think about when you have too much time on your hands, but uh, <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> I was wondering how we should, how we can circle back to intention from there. <laughs> yeah, I think I think it's all around intention. I think that uh, there, if if you're in a situation where you're being pushed to actually do something mentally to mm. get out of danger, to get out of the way. Yeah. I think we have a bunch of highly motivated people that could end up, if if they undertook this type of program and this type of going to relaxation and this mm -hmm. type of going into deep gratitude, mm -hmm. if a thousand selected individuals were to get into this, mm -hmm. I think, my own opinion, would mm -hmm. be that it would shift consciousness. I think you're absolutely right. And from everything I've read, and I've read so much and heard so much, all in bits and pieces, I think that's sort of exactly right. Um, have you heard of the physicist David Bohm? B -O yes, I have. Oh, yes, okay. I've tried to read his stuff. Well, you know, if you go to YouTube, he actually talks about his stuff, and he's, you know, it's sort of easy to understand when he's talking about it, I think. Right. I'm sure when it's written down, it's all highly dense. <laughs> but, and you know, I'm, I'm somebody who loves reading physics. You know, I used to read pop physics for a long time. Because I have an undergraduate. You'd love them. You'd love it. I, 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 yeah, I think so. But I listened to him, and I thought he was talking about pretty much the same kind of thing, wasn't he? About how uh, quantum mechanics was leading in that, leading him to that understanding that intentionality can affect the field and can change outcomes right. of reality. Yeah, so, I think if you if you take everything away, mm -hmm. especially physicality, I'm sure Catherine would love to get into this since she's a particle physicist. If you take yeah. all those things away. Uh, you're left with awareness. And your yeah. awareness mm -hmm. is consciousness. And together, mm -hmm. our group awareness is human consciousness. And, mm -hmm. and I, I like to start with that as the ground of all being. Mm -hmm. I like to think of uh, human consciousness and maybe, maybe all of consciousness as the fabric from which we create 
or something is created for yeah. us to experience. And so, yeah, I think quantum physics takes away the physicality and opens the door for um, consciousness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I think there's also um, something about power in numbers, right? The more that a group gets together and, and the more people get together and the more of a group there is um, working in the same space and focusing intention in a certain direction, the more power they generate by that kind of consensus action. Yeah, there were some uh, studies done 10, 15 years ago by the university. I can never remember the name. Uh, Mahash, uh, Maharishi. Oh, the Maharishi. Mahesh, Mahesh Yogi, I think it is. Yes, Mahesh Yogi. They were doing TM meditation. And uh, one of the experiments they did was uh, they would get a certain uh, percentage of a community to get together and meditate. Mm -hmm. Now, now was it a very small or was it a very big percentage? But uh, one of the experiments they did was in Washington, D.C. And uh, they, they issued uh, their hypothesis statement, I guess, before the study was done. Mm -hmm. And they gave it to the uh, chief of police of uh, Washington, D.C. And they said, we're going to be meditating for the next two days. And we expect to see drastic rates in uh, crime rates, murder rates, da 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 mm -hmm. And the uh, chief of police is quoted as saying, the only way you'll get these kind of numbers is if a massive snowstorm blankets the city and nobody can move. <laughs> well, they meditated for three days and met all the numbers. Yes, I remember reading about this. They were able to actually, the, um, if you look at them, there, there appears to be a correlation between the numbers going down to um, the time period of this meditation, right? Yeah. So, uh, yeah. That, so, I think there's, I think there's some evidence that mm -hmm. uh, that it works when you combine together and get a group focused on something. Yeah. I, I think. Yeah. Really yeah. Benefit. And um, you know, um, I I can tell you that working to, that going in Saturday, uh, which I used to do, I haven't been doing this for quite a while. I used to go on Saturday afternoons to this local Buddhist center and meditate with others in a group. And um, you know, they were doing this kind of, um, you know, I think like the the pasana meditation where you uh, visualize a ball of light and this ball of light enters you and enters go, goes down deep into you. And, um, you know, you're just focusing on the ball of light. You're really doing nothing else. And that's the meditation. You're not focusing on breathing or anything. You're just kind of visualizing and imagining this ball of light inside you and holding your attention there. And then you enter that space of meditation. You know, it's, it's sort of another doorway, a way to, to do that. Um, but I did notice when uh, working in, that, in a group set, setting like that, it was almost easier to get into that space faster, you know, to get, to, because everybody was sort of sitting quietly and meditating. And there was some kind of field of energy, it seems to me, some kind of power uh, generated from just being together in a group and each one of us taking our consciousness inward in that fashion. So. Yeah, I think there's a lot of potential there, good and bad. Mm, I think yeah. it could be corrupted. I know that uh, if you're hypnotizing people, Mm -hmm. It's easier to hypnotize someone if there are several other people hypnotized already there. Oh, really? I did not know that. Oh, wow. And, I, and I'm not sure that uh, people sleeping around you might induce sleep for you easier than hmm. just by yourself. I don't know about that. Uh, but, yeah, it's very interesting. And that's why I think groups getting together... Uh, could also serve like a destructive force, like uh, trance music, uh, uh, right. hypnotizing, you know, mm. massive people to be open to a certain indoctrination that 
Uh, okay. Yes, you're talking well, about mass. It. You're talking about mass hypnosis in a sense, right? Through through the means of some kind of music or. Yeah, I I, I really want to trail that along with all these different um, TI mm -hmm. solutions. You know. Right. Uh, yeah. You know, it would be. Powerful. They're powerful. Yes, it would be interesting to actually study hypnosis as opposed to meditation, because from what I understand, I thought they were both vastly different things. And in fact, people who meditate are less susceptible to hypnosis. I seem to have read that somewhere. Does that ring a bell with you? No, it doesn't ring a bell to me. Uh, okay. I, hmm. Because hypnosis suggests that, you know, you're kind of giving up your will and you're kind of giving up your sense of self and a uh, sense of uh, separateness, right? You kind of yeah, hypnosis, hypnosis really is, uh, you, it, it's the same as conscious awareness. I think it's just more like the, uh, the state you go into when you're watching TV and that flicker, right. you know, fuzzes right. you into that. Mm -hmm. uh, focused meditation is exactly the opposite. Correct. That's you're, what I was trying to say. Yeah, it's so different. Yeah. You sharpen your perception. Right, right. Let me tell you about a. Uh, I was studying with a Buddhist teacher, and uh, one day he brought in a box of raisins. Now, Interesting. He gave us each one raisin. And we spent the next half hour eating those raisins. Oh wow! The way it went, and this is a this is an amazing thing to try. Uh, first of all, you, you take the raisin and you look at the raisin, mm -hmm. and I mean, you really look at the raisin. Mm. Look at the look at the uh, the ridges and the valleys and mm -hmm. the shapes and. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you look at it and then you uh, squeeze, maybe squeeze a little bit so you can get the feel of the what it's like. Mm -hmm. And then when you go, when you finish that, then you might, uh, uh, you might even just, you might even put it in your mouth. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, you know what I'm getting at? You just go yes. one yes. little step and you're concentrating, you're totally focused on that raisin. It's the opposite of watching TV. Yes, TV, you know, it sounds you very much to me Go like ahead. a creative writing exercise, you know, where you have students like pick up an orange or, and deeply experience the orange and then write about the orange. I think it's mindfulness. Mm, yeah. I think yeah. it's, it's the opposite of TV. It's the opposite of fuzzing out yeah. and allowing so Yes, yeah, so it's the opposite of zombification, where you're just staring at the TV and all these other messages, you know, can get into your brain without you even noticing it. And That's right. uh, kind of zonk you out into some kind of strange zone. Um, whereas in well, this case, go ahead. You're very focused. in this case, you're very focused and you're using your concentration. Well, and you were, you were focused on your plants when you were in the garden, and you were probably getting mm -hmm. more color sense out of them. Um, yeah, I was. I was looking at everything. I was thinking, oh, my goodness, I haven't sketched in a long while. I need to sit out here in the garden and do some sketching. <laughs> so, yes, I was looking at everything because things are still blooming. Things are still budding. Sure. Yes, and the temperature is going down. <laughs> And they're and they're spending thousands of dollars today, overflying you with helicopters, paying all the perps in your neighborhood, flying yeah. light planes, people driving up and down the street to Correct. map you enjoying your yeah. garden. That's so exactly. that's so wonderful. <laughs> so, you know, it's like, it's the way I get back at them, I guess, by just going ahead and doing what I want to do, but, but sort of trying in a way to, to withdraw from the madness by going inward, you know, with, through, the, through the conscious breathing. So, um, the thing that I had wanted to mention before um, that I think I talked about with Mindy was, um, you know, along the lines of connecting with um, 
with not just intention but or connecting with the unified field but connecting with nature and in a sense connecting with um, nature and sort of aligning oneself with nature you know and with the earth um and and sort of and then this has to go back to this goes back to yoga and the chakras and you know sort of entering your heart chakra space and sort of um moving your serenity vibrations out from your heart chakra space in connection with nature and in connection with the earth and kind of sending good vibes out into the atmosphere uh as well so that's something i do when i uh, I, I like doing that because it's a way of sort of consciously connecting with nature, you know. So when I remember when I'm outside, that's something I try to do. But that might be a way too that people might, um, you know, it's not exactly something out of a book. It's just something I do. So I'm just sort of throwing it out there in case um, people find that useful as well. Because everybody loves nature, right? Everyone goes out for a walk and enjoys the quietness and the trees and the birds and so forth. So why not take it one step further and connect at a deeper level by sort of entering your own heart chakra space and sort of sending love to the trees, in other words, you know. So right. it, it's kind of connected to, you know how you hear the story about um, how love, well, I'm sure you, I've heard it from you, Paul, I've heard it from various people that love is the most powerful force, you know. It's the opposite of what um, the hate that's coming our way, the, the repression that's coming our way. But it's very hard for people who are being assaulted to, to sort of suddenly send love to the people who are doing this to them, you know? And um, it's certainly hard for me to. I can't say I'm there I'm in that spiritual space where I can send love to my neighbors who are tracking and, you know, hitting me with um, potable uh, directed energy weapons and permitting people to park in their driveways and hit me and so on and so forth. I can't say that I feel great love or that I can send out love to them at this point in time, but I can um, focus on my own heart chakra space and I can connect with things that I do love, you know, which is the garden or nature or, or um, my writing. I can, that's what I would say to people, you know, connect with, with things that you do love, with spaces that you do love, and send that love out into the world so that you exist in a state of love. But it doesn't necessarily, you're not being asked to do the really hard thing, which is, you know, love your enemy as yet, which I know is in the Bible. And, you know, perhaps the holy spiritual people can really get that, you know. But well, it's, not... it's, it's the ultimate walking out of duality. Mm, yeah. You, the only way. We're, we're in a uh, lesson of duality, or uh, the Christians, I uh, think, uh, call it more of a test. But it it's definitely deals with duality. And it seems to me that that duality is like Chinese handcuffs. Mm. You know, there's little, mm. you know what Chinese handcuffs are? Oh, no, I actually do describe them. Well, they're, it's a little woven piece of... Uh, just a uh, straw that they make in China. Okay. And you put a finger in one side and a finger in the other side. It's just a little tube. And okay. when you pull it, pull apart, the, uh, the fibers tighten and they hold you in the handcuffs. Oh, the wow. only way to get out of the handcuffs is push your fingers together and the, and the handcuffs will drop off. Oh my. Very interesting. So, yeah, unless you unless you've seen them, uh, uh -huh. Google, Google them. I'm sure that they haven't taken Chinese handcuffs off of Google yet. Okay. But anyway, <laughs> the more you pull on one side, the more mm -hmm. it polarizes the other side. Uh, the more, and both and the extremes of both sides are ultimate corruption. So, the the, the lesson in duality isn't to pull away because what you resist persists. Mm -hmm. The lesson in duality is mm -hmm. to go above it mm -hmm. and see that the entire playing field is orchestrated. Mm -hmm. and, I, and, that, and I know that's really a leap, especially for people who are being hit by these monsters. Yes, yeah. I, I mean, it's. Um, I think to some extent, intellectually, you can see that the, the, the whole playing field is indeed being orchestrated and choreographed 
um, all of this is, you know, a sort of set up provocation that you that one is surrounded with. Um, it's so up close, it's in your face. It's very hard to to pull away and be completely, you know, uh, Buddhist about it, completely right. Zen about it. Um, but that's but that's the whole uh, incentive to get like that. I mean, uh, it's it's an incentive for all of us because honestly, whether you're in this program or you're not, you're targeted in the same way if you're mm -hmm. human. Right. I mean, we're all being targeted, actually, right now at this period in time, right? We're all being targeted. Exactly. So this is one way, this is one technique and one many of them on this uh, portal mm -hmm. of a way of climbing out of it. Because the duality, I think, is self-defeating. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember uh, a couple years ago watching... Uh, a video, it's on YouTube, called uh, The History of the Devil. And uh, it goes back to uh, the different conceptualizations of, uh, of this satanic creature. And okay. it seems to me that when it started off, it wasn't as horrible. It wasn't as uh, all-encompassing evil as it is today. I mean, today we have up in our face, yes. pedophilia. I mean, we have the depth of mm -hmm. evil. Mm -hmm. Yes. Everything to do with children. I mean, all the child molestation, the child sacrifice that you hear, the satanic ritual abuse, the, ch uh, the you know, the trafficking the, of women, children, the organ harvesting, all of this. I mean, it's been surrounded. It's horrible. Yeah. It's horrible. And, of course, Satan is the enemy of Christ. Mm. And so you have your dichotomy. And of course, Christianity, as much of it is the good positive answer, mm -hmm. take it to its extreme becomes Calvinism and Puritanism and, you know, kind of an unworking kind of thing. Fundamentalism. So, yes, almost anything yeah. to an extreme becomes, you know, repressive. Right. So, so pulling away. I, you know, I don't want anybody to lose their religion over anything I say, because I sure don't know. But it seems, just seems to me that pulling in the Chinese handcuffs isn't going to get us out of them. Oh, right. And yes. It, it's only gratitude and understanding, and if we, could, if we could ever achieve love, that would be the ultimate. Uh, I, do, yes. I have interviewed a woman who she's going to be on here in a couple of weeks who has been able to stop her uh, stop her her program mm -hmm. because she just sends them love and she's she's a very interesting woman i can't wait to get her on here oh but, sounds uh, wonderful yes yeah. yeah i mean i've met people also i mean i think um yoon shin james shin he's the guy who painted his car and um drove from venice california all the way to new york um, you know, and prayed at Jewish temples and and uh, Masonic lodges along the way because basically this ritual and what he was doing was he was praying for the people in these Masonic centers to break out of their um, sort of conceptualizing of the world as the is and imposition of their um, you know, ideologies, repressive ideologies on the rest of us, and basically, of you know, being the bad guys that they are. So, um, but in, because he chose Jewish temples and Jewish synagogues, uh, he kind of uh, came under the radar of DHS. And um, in Stamford, Connecticut, he was arrested. And of course, his car is, you know, it's a flashy car. It's like a very small, I, I don't know what kind of make it is. It's just a small car. It's, uh, but it's dark blue and it's painted. I, I did an article on him and I, um, you know, posted pictures of his car because I thought it's fantastic that he did this with targeted individual painted on it and silent weapons for quiet wars and various quotes from that PDF, you know, painted on it and quotes from JFK's last speech about secret societies and uh, things about 9-11, the great deception and, 
and so on. And, uh, you know, he obviously a very attention getting kind of vehicle. Um, well, he was arrested. He was thrown in jail. He was in jail for seven months. And I um, spoke to him and he sent me all of this information, which, you know, I published again about his entire experience. Um, one of the, a couple of the things that he said to me really astonished me, though. One was he said that during that time in jail, he took time to really meditate and go inward. And in a sense, it kind of calmed him down and made, uh, kind of leveled him out or, or calm, it really sort of made him much more of a serene person rather than an angry person about the targeting. And the other thing he said was, um, oh yes, he, now he says when he meets people, whether they are, you know, people who are stalking him or just normal people out, he, he gives them the same attitude. You know, in other words, he's friendly with everybody. He doesn't differentiate. And uh, he doesn't respond to provocation. Um, he, he is a very spiritual and very calm person. You know, he meditates and things. So, uh, But he's able, in a sense, to, to treat all people in the same way now. And I think that's fantastic to come well, to that point. To be that would be a major breakthrough to be able to do that. Yes, yes, I, I, I think so, too. Yes. So, so they'd finally realize that you really can't map human consciousness mm -hmm. human consciousness well it's just separate from the mind i think and uh mm -hmm. it, i think you're right and uh, yes yes and from that's everything that i read too from all of these traditions you know that consciousness is separate from the mind that the mind um it's the mind is, the mind is the monkey mind right we're constantly having thoughts bouncing up and down our brains there is once you tap into that field of consciousness, you're sort of in a more serene state. Exactly. The monkey mind is really an interesting concept. Because mm, yeah. that's, that's, the, uh, that's the matrix, is the monkey mind. It's the, right. it's, it's the chatter that keeps going on. It's the world out there that really may or may not be out there that keeps encroaching upon your inner self. And... Uh, yeah, the monkey mind is really an interesting concept. And it might be that we have enough uh, special self-selected people uh, getting involved in this that uh, you know it can really it can really make a difference in the whole energy field here. I think. Mm -hmm. Yes, I hope so. Yes, I think so. And it's, you know, you don't even have to be targeted, like in the ways that some of us are with weapons, with directed energy weapons, to, to make a difference in the energy field, right? I mean, all you need to do is, um, is sort of commit to um, entering that space more often, that space of serenity and um, in, inwardness and inner tranquility. Right. And get out of the... Uh created puppet show world that uh, flashes by on your TV screen and, and mm -hmm. things that you you make up about people and uh, just just get out of that totally and mm -hmm. uh, and relax uh, enjoy yourself boy what a strange way out isn't it yeah yeah, 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 but it's you know it's possible, and I think that's what we've been talking about. It's possible, um, even if it's for just a few minutes in the day or a few hours in the day. It's possible to to break out of that um, space of always feeling that you're being provoked, you're being harassed, you're being kind of harried and focused on, which you are, you know, that you're being surveilled and stalked and all that. It's it's possible to break out of that awareness. So, wow. so that's hopeful. Well. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's what I wanted to do with this uh, surfing the portal thing. Yes, I uh, think it's a wonderful gonna... place. Thank you. Well, you're welcome to come back anytime. Uh, Thank you. Paul. I was uh, I was not able to get into the chat today. I couldn't uh, either. I, w did you do this through Pinecone Utopia or through some oh, other? Oh, yeah, that's <laughs> I did it through Paul Marco. That's why I'm in the oh, wrong. Okay. Because I opened so, it and I couldn't find it. I guess that's why. Okay. This is, uh, let me see if I can find it. Nope. It's not even there either. So. Oh, I see. So. That's uh, odd. But never mind. At least we've uh, had this conversation, I guess. Oh, can... no. Here it is. Here it is. 
Well, oh, you know, seven, seven people are watching and uh, oh, there's some old friends here. Great topic is here. Oh, excellent. Cact, uh, great topic, cactus juice. Uh, well, that's the two people. Wonderful. Good to see great, great topic always shows up. Uh, that's great. Oh, it looks like Mindy was on. Oh, okay. So, so oh, that's I, cool. Yeah, I'm just so, so I'm gonna. Uh, did, did, should we get? Uh, uh, kind of finish it off? Yes, absolutely. I think we've had like an hour's conversation, right? <laughs> you know, we had more than an hour's conversation, and it's probably one of the most fascinating conversations I've ever been involved in. It was really fun. It was really fun. It was very uh, interesting. We traveled a lot of places, and you know, you've incited me to to go look into a whole lot of subjects at this point in time. And um, you know, I and I would like to have you on my show at some point, um, Paul, and to talk further about consciousness uh, from your uh, consciousness studies book and everything. Good. I'll be happy to do it any time. Wonderful. Uh, and uh, I'd like to encourage the rest of you, uh, selected people and people who aren't selected, uh, this mindfulness meditation technique. Uh, it's so powerful. It works individually. It works together. And uh, I think we need to start working together to climb out of this mess and leave this uh, black and white, good guy, bad guy uh, mm -hmm. stuff behind us and move on to uh, some other more interesting lessons. Because I, quite frankly, I've had it with this one. Yeah, I think I do. <laughs> We're a little bored now. <laughs> That's right. I'm a little bored with this one. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you very much. Good night, Ramola. Thank you Good very Ramola. much for having me on, Paul. Good night, everyone. See you another time. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay.